Confessions 7. This was a constant subject of gloomy talk among my circle of friends, but I used to discuss it especially with Olypius and Nebridius. Olypius came from my own town and his people were one of the leading families. He was younger than I was and had been a student of mine both in our own town when I first began to teach and later on at Carthage. He was greatly attached to me because he thought that I was a good and learned man, and I was fond of him because although he was still young, it was quite clear that he had much natural disposition to goodness. But he had been caught in the whirl of easy morals at Carthage, with its continual round of futile entertainments, and had lost his heart and his head to the games in the amphitheatre. At the time when he was so wrapped up in this wretched sport, I had opened my school as professor of rhetoric in Carthage, but because of some difference of opinion which had occurred between his father and me, he was not one of my pupils. I found out that he was fatally attracted by the games, and it caused me grave anxiety to think that he was likely to ruin a future which promised so well, if he had not already done so. But I had no means of offering him advice or using any pressure to restrain him, for I could claim neither the privilege of a friend nor the right of a master. I thought that he shared his father's feelings about me, although in fact this was not the case for he ignored his father's wishes and treated me with courtesy when we met. He soon began to come and listen to some of my lectures, but he never stayed for long. I had forgotten that I might use my influence with him to prevent him from wasting his talents in this thoughtless, impetuous enthusiasm for futile pastimes. But you, O oh Lord, who hold the reins of all you have created, had not forgotten this man, who was one day to be a bishop and administer your sacrament to your children. You used me to set him on the right path, but so that we might recognize that it was all by your doing, you used me without my knowledge. One day, as I sat in my usual place with my pupils before me, Olypius came in and after greeting me politely, sat down and listened attentively to the lesson. It occurred to me that the passage which I happened to be reading could very well be explained by an illustration taken from the games in the arena. It would appeal to the students and make my meaning clearer, and it would also enable me to make a laughing stock of those who were under the spell of this insane sport. You know, my God, that I was not thinking of Olypius, who is so badly needed to be cured of this mania. But he took my words to heart, thinking that I had meant the allusion to apply to him alone. Anyone else would have taken this as a good reason to be angry with me, but this conscientious young man saw in it cause for anger with himself and a warmer affection for me. Long ago, you caused these words of yours to be inserted in your book. The wise are grateful for a remonstrance. I had not meant to rebuke him, but you use us all, whether we know it or not, for a purpose which is known to you, a purpose which is just. You made my heart and my tongue burn like coals to sear his mind, which was so full of promise, and cure it when it was sick of a wasting disease. Those who have no inkling of your mercy may be silent and offer you no word of praise, but from the depths of my heart I make a vowel of your mercy. For after he had heard my words, Olypius hastened to drag himself out of the deep pitfall into which, dazzled by the allure of pleasure, he had plunged of his own accord. By a great effort of self-control, he shook himself free of all the dirt of the arena and never went near it again. Then he managed to overcome his father's reluctance to allow him to become a pupil of mine. His father gave in and granted his request. But once he had started his studies with me, he became involved in my superstitious beliefs. He particularly admired the Manichees for their ostensible continence, which he thought quite genuine, though of course it was merely a nonsensical and deceitful method of trapping precious souls which had not learned to feel the depth of real virtue and were easily deceived by the appearance of virtue that was spurious and counterfeit.